ways of making money from this tremendous talent and prepared to offer him great sums to leap exclusively for them and their customers. One man, a politician of conservative ilk, thought the man presumptuous, saying, these young whippersnappers always leaping about, disturbing the status quo ought to be controlled. They set bad examples for our youth. This leaping business will never replace the tried and true institutions. Another man, long of hair and ideology, protested the leaping man, argued that it was a bourgeois capitalist diversion which gave false hope to the masses and distracted from the need to communize the world. But most of the crowd just watched quietly and passively with moderate interest in this man who leaped high and gazed about. Finally, a child slipped through the crowd, stood near the place where the man landed from his leaps. The child watched for a long time as the man soared up, floated down, and soared yet again. Finally, the child said, Hey, mister, what do you see? Please join me, ladies and gentlemen, in saying to Mr. Weiner, hey, mister, what do you see? Thank you very much. There are some introductions that dig a hole for you, and it gets very hard to leap out of them. <laughs> Now, <clears throat> in this symposium on leaping the future, I was asked to talk about methodology. And uh, I don't really want to talk about methodology. Um, but I will in a way. I want to talk about how do you know anything about the future, if you do. But what I really want to talk about is the meaning of the future. And of course, how you know something is very closely related to what it is you think you know. And this is especially true of the future, because it doesn't exist. And therefore, it is whatever people imagine. It doesn't exist because it hasn't happened yet. And many of the things that are going to happen, and that will be very important, don't belong to any distribution of probabilities we know anything about. They can't be described in terms of a system of the kind that Dr. McHale was describing to you this morning. We don't know enough about the system, as he admitted. We simply don't know what's going to happen. And when it comes to very important concerns of ours, we know very much less than we would like to about what's going to happen. So how you know it is very closely related to what it may mean to you. And there are various mystiques about the future, and there are various attitudes toward it. Um, we've heard two rather optimistic presentations so far today, very positive, each in its own way rather heroic. I think I ought to, to bring in some explicit comment on the other discussion so that we can make this into a symposium as early as possible. By the way, you'll notice the attitude of, of, uh, of two of my colleagues toward uh, what I'm going to say. They don't want to be on the platform with me while I say it. And, um, but they've agreed to come back uh, during the question period when they can argue. But in the meantime, I'm happy to have Dr. Borlaug on my side. Now, these attitudes to the future, the positive attitude, you all know there are other attitudes. I'm reminded of a conversation I had with a girl uh, not so long ago, a college student, who told me that she had watched a uh, television soap opera called Search for Tomorrow. And she said, I don't get it. Why should anyone want to search for tomorrow? All you have to do is wait, and it'll come get you. And this is one possible attitude toward the future, one that's all too prevalent. There is a new pessimism, a feeling that the system doesn't work, that the future is full of problems that are worse than problems that people have, ha have faced before. There's some evidence for it, but the feeling exists a great deal more than the evidence does. 
Dr. Borla mentioned earlier that it's very difficult to, um, he said that to, to attempt constructive social change is, is a most thankless job and described the characteristics, the, the thick-skinned, um, uh, blind uh, characteristics that a man trying to do constructive social change ought to have. Um, it is a most thankless job, and it is has become a more thankless job in the last five years or so than it used to be. And this is something I want to come back to, because I think we can understand some things about it and maybe understand some things about the future that we're moving into by looking at this kind of evidence, at this sort of trend. We live in a society that has become much less willing to take credit for its successes. The Green Revolution, for example, is an extraordinarily dramatic success, which reverses or gives at least the, the possibility for a reversal of what otherwise would have seen an almost hopeless situation, the, the poverty trap of the underdeveloped countries, uh, where it is impossible to accumulate any surplus over subsistence. For the first time, it looks as though a generation, perhaps, perhaps more, two or three perhaps at most, uh, will at least have the opportunity to accumulate some surplus and to move beyond subsistence agriculture. Maybe they can do something with this if at the same time they learn to control their population growth. Here we have an opportunity. Here we have an extraordinary success. We don't take credit for it. Now, of course, we don't all deserve credit for it. But in our appraisal of the state of the society, uh, in our views of what the future holds in store for us. It's characteristic of people who think about these issues to be pessimistic and to fail to notice some of the things uh, which are working and which have improved. In fact, by almost any objective criterion, most of the things that are happening in our social system are working better than they did a few years ago. Uh, the standard rhetoric is one of crisis and despair. And there is certainly a crisis, but the crisis is one of perception. The crisis is one of our, of our expectations. The crisis is one of the way in which we imagine the future, rather than a crisis of how the system is working objectively. I want to come back to this. There's also an old optimism about the future. Uh, interest in the future used to be confined to people who built utopias, although in the last century or two, uh, much of that interest has been devoted to the construction of dystopias. You know, a utopia is nowhere. If you spelled it EU, it would mean a, a good place. No one has written an EU utopia in quite a while. Uh, but a dystopia would be a bad place. And 1984, Brave New World, uh, many similar efforts are dystopian works of the imagination. One of the, of course, there are other people who are interested in the, in the future. There is a theology of hope. Uh, there is an interest in, in, uh, in eschatology and last things. Uh, there are people who are concerned about whether or not God has promised us one kind of future or another. And in almost any society, you will find beliefs um, uh, relating to this sort of issue. In most societies, current history is seen as static, an endless process where the condition of man does not change. But finally, at the end of things, there will be a period of salvation or a return to the happy hunting grounds, uh, some way in which man is lifted out of history. Western industrial society is unique in having, uh, perhaps unique, close to unique, I think, in having a concept of progress, of secular material progress. And this is something uh, which is quite important to us. Now, I've already said the, the future doesn't exist, and there's no way we can know it directly. But that doesn't mean that we're powerless to form expectations about it. Obviously, we do all the time. We couldn't conduct our daily lives. We couldn't make the simplest decisions if we didn't have some reasonably good expectations about the future, which have to do not only with the fact that the sun will rise tomorrow, but uh, have to do with the way people will behave toward us and uh, various kinds of other things uh, that we anticipate with more or less uh, confidence. 
we can look around and we can see some of the things that have been changing in our society and we can ask ourselves to what extent is it likely that these will continue to change. And this doesn't make us a slave to projections. It merely means we're asking an intelligent question. If this has been going on, is it likely to continue? We see that there has been economic growth. Uh, this tends to be about 4 or 5% in real terms each year in uh, most Western countries. A lot of the underdeveloped countries uh, who are now achieving some sort of takeoff uh, are doing much better. Uh, Japan is achieving a rate of uh, 12 or 13 or 14 percent a year in economic growth. The fact that this growth occurs is a social phenomenon and the burden of proof is really on people who would argue that a period of growth which has gone on for some time will now stop. There has to be a reason for it to stop because it will continue as a result of business as usual. If people continue to do the things they have been doing this year, next year, including innovation in science and technology at the rate they have innovated up to now, then economic growth will continue. It's also true that population growth will continue. And we know a good deal about the range of growth rates to be expected. Uh, the kinds of mistakes that are made in um, demographic projections are rather small compared to the basic fact uh, that we tend to get growth rates of something like uh, somewhere between zero and uh, perhaps uh, three percent, something in that range for most countries. Whether it's zero or three percent, of course, makes a huge difference. Technologies also grow at these same rates, at compound interest, at exponential rates. What you have at the end of any period of time is a function of what you had during that period. Uh, represents some increase. And here again, that shouldn't be too surprising because what you get out of a technology is a result of the amount of social activity that is carried on in research and development in that technological field. Yet in another sense, it's extremely surprising because as we know, technology proceeds uh, by surprising inventions, uh, accidents, serendipities, discoveries made by accident while looking for something else, synergisms, things that are put together so that the whole is equal to more than the sum of its parts, all sorts of things like this which are specifically unpredictable make up the progress of technology. Yet, if you smooth out the overall pattern and look at it, you see there has been this steady growth. You can even say what the interest rate is. For example, uh, I think the most striking example is the rate of growth of computer technology. If you look at the capacity of computers uh, to process information, the amount of information they can handle at, uh, times the speed with which they can handle the information, and you go back to the first Harvard Mark uh, I computer in 1944, you take all the major machines which have been introduced to the market in the year they were introduced to the market, it turns out this technology has been growing by a factor of 10 every two and a half years, remarkably steadily. And if at any point in the past you had predicted or had learned to expect that you would get another factor of 10 improvement in your computer capacity in the next two and a half years, you would have been right. If you have that expectation today, you may well be right. In fact, the burden of proof is really on someone to argue that something has happened to computers uh, so that that rate of growth will no longer continue. Of course, at some point, it will no longer continue. Uh, no rate of growth, by definition, can go on forever or it expands to fill the universe. So every growth rate we know about will top out. The question is how, under what circumstances, uh, what else will happen? The computer thing is important, and let me dwell on this for a minute because it illustrates several important points. Notice that this growth rate could not have occurred had it not been for a whole series of technological innovations which came along at uh, a regular rate, but without which the growth rate could not have occurred. One of them, for example, perhaps the most important in some respects, was the transistor. If the transistor had not been invented, this growth rate for computers would have topped out uh, a long, long time ago. 
And yet, if you had spoken to the uh, to the Harvard uh, Mark I computer people in 1944 and told them that you expected a growth rate of a factor of 10 every two and a half years and explained that this was to be achieved because someone would invent a device like the computer, they would have told you at that time that the device you were describing was contrary to the laws of physics and would never be invented. In fact, it was the common belief um, in 1944 that a, trans a transistor-like device could not be produced. Uh, all right. This illustrates, by the way, the enormous difficulty of trying to address the heroic set of questions which Dr. McHale posed to us this morning. You know, uh, to ask yourselves, when will energy resources be depleted? At what point will the runoff from the intensive fertilization required by the high-yield grains reach the point where eutrophication of the oceans becomes uh, a major consideration uh, which one could balance against the gains in food production. Now, there are people who have suggested um, uh, very positively answers to such questions. What I am suggesting is that we do not know the answers to those questions. They are questions worth asking, but we ought not to put too much hope in getting those answers very early or in learning what to do on the basis of getting those answers. Now, as I say, I was asked to talk on methodology. And I want to make a few comments about methodology of looking at the future. There's an enormous interest in methodology. One reason is that many people have learned to think of methodology as a kind of black box, which you can crank up, and then it will go to work on your problem for you. And you won't have to think about it at all. So that when people have invented, for example, interesting scenarios, interesting narratives of the kinds of things that might happen in the future, the next thing that happens to them is that they are asked, what is your methodology for constructing these scenarios? And you are expected to have a series of rules so that anyone can make up a scenario by following the rules without having to think about what is it about my scenario that is really plausible, interesting, distinctive, Am I focusing on an important problem? Am I learning anything uh, by following this train of thought? There's a great tendency to talk about as-if systems, to say it would be desirable if we understood the social system. Now let us make a diagram, which is a very crude metaphor for the social system. We may even put make a flow chart, something of that sort. It may look a lot like plumbing when we get through. Now let us forget that this is a crude metaphor for the social system and go on to analyze in some detail the system which we have now described. But it's a purely hypothetical system existing only in our own imaginations, corresponding very crudely to the social system. You need only look at the literature of social and political analysis and at the attempts made by many extremely intelligent and well-intentioned people to analyze social problems by making formal models, to see how often an imaginary piece of plumbing is mistaken for um, urban dynamics uh, or uh, the, uh, I've seen one paper which was described as, which was titled, The Socio-Political System of the Planet Earth. Actually, it was in German, and it sounds even better in German. Um, but somehow, it isn't quite real. All right. What we really need for dealing with the future is not so much this kind of systematic parametric analysis, although somebody ought to be doing it, but we need better techniques for dealing with the unexpected. We need to make analyses of contingencies. We need to think through what would we do if, and we have to bear in mind that most of the ifs we spend time thinking about will not take place, and some other if that we didn't think about will take place. The reason it will take place is entirely beyond our ken. It's just very improbable. So many things happen uh, as we go through life. So many things happen in a complex system like a society that many things happen which are very, very improbable. There are just the, the numbers involved. N is that large. 
You've all had the experience, for example, of walking down the street in a strange city uh, and meeting someone you know who also doesn't live in that city. And you think, what are the odds against this meeting? You know, it's incredible. On the other hand, you do pass a great many faces walking down streets in the course of a lifetime. Uh, the N is very large. All right. Now, I think we need a technique for dealing with the unexpected, and I think there ought to be an academic discipline for this technique, and I've given it a name. The reason I've given it a name is that I know that when you give it a name, you're more likely to have the discipline, and if you give it a name, you may even be able to stop thinking about it because you have a classification for it. This happens very often, as you know. Uh, it's best to take these names. It's, it's good to take the names from German or Latin, but it's even better to take them from Greek. And so I suggest adochistics, which would mean the technique of dealing with the unexpected. All right, let's go back to the expected. What are the major things? You need at least a standard case to begin with. Now, in my standard case, affluence continues to increase, population continues to increase, technology continues to develop, and people change how they feel about these things, and people change what they do about them in accordance with some ideas we have about some of the things that motivate people. Let's go back to the difference between Western society and the other societies that I referred to briefly, which Dr. McHale referred to also this morning, the ones that are static, that are traditional, uh, where the life of man does not change. It seems to me that the fundamental characteristic of our society, of our attitude toward change, toward ourselves, toward our environment, which creates these changes, is something which I like to call manipulative rationality. This is a rather important point, I think, because the reason for the changes that are taking place in our society has a lot to do with what the changes will mean to us as they do take place. Now, by manipulative rationality, that's an awkward phrase. What I mean is our tendency to think rationally in terms of logical relationship of means and ends and then to behave manipulatively, by which I mean the tendency we have to intervene in events to act so as to change things. If we don't like a situation, we think through some way of improving it. We can get higher yield in grain. We can reorganize an organization. Uh, we can make all kinds of inventions. We can intervene in our own selves uh, through surgery, through psychotherapy, through drugs. The characteristic attitude of our society is if we are not satisfied with the situation, let us find some way to change it and let us think through how to do this. This clearly is at the root of um, our economic progress, our technological progress, and much of our current dissatisfaction with that same progress. Now, just to make it clear, this characteristic, I think, does not exist to the same degree in primitive societies. Uh, let's take a, an example. Suppose you go up to a man in Polynesia, and this man is, um, perhaps he's building a dugout canoe. He's digging out a canoe. You say to him, why are you doing this? What are you doing? And then he says, in effect, I'm doing the canoe building ritual. You say, well, why are you doing it? He says, because it's that time of year. We've done the canoe building dance. We've sung the canoe building song. It's time to do the canoe building. Well, you say, now look, you have manipulative rationality. You think functionally. You analyze the system in which he's operating. And you say, now aren't you really building that canoe because your people need another boat with which to go out and catch fish and, and bring in some more food? Now, he has no difficulty recognizing the validity of what you're saying, that is, recognizing that those effects will occur as a result of his activity, but it isn't his primary reason. As Dr. Borlaug pointed out, it can become his primary reason. Uh, he can change if given enough incentive. And there are very few, um, or there are a decreasing number of traditional societies left around the world for that reason, as you know. Uh, the typical... I understand that the typical Navajo household consists of um, a mother, a father, three children, and an anthropologist. And um, 
this has become a kind of worldwide problem. But at any rate, that isn't the main reason he's building a canoe. If it were, and if he thought the way we think in the West, he might, and by the West here, I certainly include uh, the communist countries of Eastern Europe, and I certainly include Japan. I include any industrialized country. If he thought the way we did, he'd ask other questions. He'd ask, is there some better way to build this canoe? Uh, should we be doing so much fishing from small boats, or should we spread out some nets along the shore? What are the long-term trends affecting our fishing grounds? Has anyone studied the food chain of these fish? Has anyone taken the temperature of these waters? Uh, has anyone observed the uh, political and economic development of other countries to, um, in order to, uh, to guess whether or not they may intrude on our fishing grounds? For example, what is happening to the Peruvian or Japanese fishing industries, and are they likely to come in here in the near future? Uh, or in the foreseeable future. And if there is this possibility, can we apply now uh, to the Ford Foundation for a grant and aid um, so that we could train someone who could go and represent us at the UN or in some other appropriate forum uh, with respect to this contingency? Well, this is the kind of question that we ask in industrial societies. It just doesn't get asked that often in a traditional society. If it did, the society would not remain traditional. Now, it's only a matter of degree. Most of the things we do are done on a perfectly prescribed, ritualized basis. And that's really as it should be. Uh, we've all seen uh, even things like long-range planning rituals done. We've seen research rituals conducted where people did not really know why they were, asked, why they were inquiring into the problem that way, but that was the way one inquired into that problem. We've seen education rituals conducted with no one asking, is there some better way to achieve the results we want, and so forth. But some part of the society, some part of the time, is asking the question, wait a minute, is there some other way to do it? Now, I said it was fortunate we're not always doing it, because most of the things we do, we necessarily learn by being shown how. It would be too complicated to learn them any other way. A very simple example is tying your shoes. We've all learned, I think, to tie our shoes, uh, generally by age five or six or something like that, and by being shown how. If, you, if we lived in a society where no one had learned to tie his shoes, and suddenly there was a new requirement that we invent a knot which would have the right properties, easy to make, and holds fast when pulled out one way, but releases instantly when pulled out the other way, we had to commission a research project. We had to get some mathematical topologists uh, to, to furnish us with the proof uh, that this knot would have the desired characteristics. It would be a rather tedious and expensive process. Now, as we become a society that relies more and more on this manipulative rationality for working out new solutions to social and political problems, we are more and more in the position of people who can no longer be shown how to tie our shoes because the requirements have changed, but now must think it through. And it's a very tough proposition. And it's part of one of the, um, uh, part of the dissatisfaction we have with the very real progress we have achieved, part of the malaise that exists with respect uh, to the fact that in real terms the system works very well. I never have people had more uh, economically, physically, and even socially, contrary to popular impression. You even look at things like poverty, race, and so forth. By any objective indicator, those problems are much improved, very much improved, over what they were five or ten years ago. Yet many, many people are unaware of this and think the opposite has occurred. Uh, well, partly because of the way in which it has occurred. Let me illustrate this a little more. Now, I've been a little facetious about systems analysis, and, I, and I, I shouldn't be, because actually at Hudson Institute we do policy studies. Uh, for example, we will uh, do a study for something for a government department like housing and urban development and ask, what is the relationship between housing programs on the one hand and urban development policies on the other? And this requires looking at the system of which housing programs and, the, and developing cities are a part. 
and asking uh, what happens when you push one part of this system? What else moves? Imagine it like a mobile. When you push something, everything else moves, sometimes in very surprising ways. As Pat Moynihan likes to put it, it moves in counterintuitive ways. Very often this is true. And it needs a little analysis to see that. So we do a kind of systems analysis, in a sense. I want to tell you a story about one of our people. He had a very interesting experience, which will illustrate, I think, something of what I'm talking about. This young man was a very good systems analyst. He came home one night, and he was very much surprised. He saw that the dinner table was set with the best tablecloth, the best china, the best silver. Uh, there were flowers on the table. There was a bucket of champagne next to the table. And although he was late for dinner, he was frequently late, uh, his wife was there in her best dress and smiling. And he realized at that point that it was his anniversary, and he had forgotten all about it. But he had an idea. He said, darling, it's been my experience at work that whenever a study is done of some ongoing system that's functioning effectively, the conclusions of that study tend to support the continuation of that system. Well, she didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> so he went on. He said, what I mean is let's now do a systems analysis of our marriage. This is the best way we can celebrate our anniversary. We'll do it very informally. We'll each take a sheet of paper, and let's each make a list of every parameter of this system that's important to us, either positive or negative. And uh, then we'll rate ourselves according to that dimension. Now I'll have to give each one of these its proper weight. Now, for example, let's see. Uh, the fact that I'm often late for dinner, that's the kind of thing you could list, but obviously you can't give it a very large coefficient. That should be given a small weight. On the other hand, because you know I'm busy, on the other hand, the fact that you cannot park the car very well and we are getting repair bills now and then, that's something which I think is a good deal more serious and I intend to rate that more heavily. But let's not quibble about that. <laughs> we'll each make our own list. And we'll put down everything that's of any importance. Then we'll add it all up. We'll get a score that represents the performance of our marriage as a system. Now, that by itself doesn't tell us very much. We really need to make comparisons with alternatives because a fundamental principle of policy analysis is that you do not understand any of your options until you have compared that option with all the alternatives. All right. Now, let's see. We can't take the case in which we never got married because lots of things have changed. We can, however, take the case in which we immediately get divorced. And in column B, let us rate that situation according to the same variables. Then, really, we can take some alternative marriages. Now, I don't want you to idealize uh, any hypothetical cases because you know how unrealistic you can be sometimes. <laughs> let's, let's do it this way. Um, you take Bob and Ted, and I'll take Carol and Alice, and we'll imagine what it might be like with them, and uh, we'll rate it. We don't have to show each other the scores, but after we've added them all up, we'll see how lucky we are, and this system will be supported for its continuation until the time comes up for the next reevaluation. So he set to work very happily, and she left the table crying, and then he sat there for a long time wondering, what had he done wrong? <laughs> well, he was not the kind of fellow who gave up easily on an intellectual problem. So uh, no matter how difficult. So uh, he did think it through. And the next day at lunch, he told some of us about it. He said, I finally understood the mistake I made. And that was that I had never done a preliminary feasibility study. And if I had done that, I would have been able to weigh the value of the study uh, as a contributor to the rationale of the continuation of the marriage, on the one hand, against the disutility of subjecting our marriage to explicit 
rational analysis. That's right, there was a disutility in subjecting this commitment to analysis. Now that implies, doesn't it, that the commitment has some utility that you could weigh against the disutility of questioning it. Now let's go back to the primitive society. Uh, a commitment in a primitive society, one which is backed with the prescribed moral, spiritual force of the community and of supernatural powers, is not something that's subject to analysis, and it's not something uh, that has a utility. It's an absolute, simply not subject to revision. In our society, although I've deliberately given you a kind of extreme uh, and, some, and um, um, hypothetical um, example, in our society, anything is potentially subject to this kind of reevaluation and reassessment. Uh, we don't have time. I could give you many examples. You need only reflect, for example, on the kind of debate which took place, let us say, in the New York State Legislature before the law liberalizing abortion was passed last year. And look at the grounds of the discussion, not the result, not which argument was right, but just the basis of the discussion. What was the issue? The principal issue seemed to be whether legalizing abortion was more conducive to the uh, net result of human happiness than keeping it illegal. Now, it wasn't very long ago that the discussion would have been very different. Suppose someone makes the case. People will be better off if abortion is legalized. Uh, this is true for many reasons. One, um, women feel they have a right to decide uh, what is going to happen to them. This is a decision they want to make, and they will be much happier if they can make the decision legally. Two, a lot of harm is done by illegal abortions, uh, and these, these harms could be eliminated. Three, we have a population problem. Anyhow, we ought not to add unwanted uh, additions to the population. Four, uh, it's well known that uh, unwanted children uh, don't get brought up as well or in, in as... Uh, as healthy an emotional atmosphere as children who are wanted and loved by their parents, etc. All right, you could spell out all these reasons and make the case people will be better off if abortions are legalized. Now, what would the answer be to that? The answer to that would have been, well, it's against God's law. And then the argument would go back and say, well, but God's law is interfering with human happiness. And the answer to that would be, but that's not relevant. God did not promise happiness. You know, God imposed a law. Now, that argument was hardly heard in the current debate, and it is one which is less and less heard in our society. I'm not saying it should be. I'm pointing to an important social change, which I think is at the crux of a lot of, of the dilemmas of progress that we are now getting into. The argument was, well, on the other hand, there are lots of ways in which people will be less happy if we legalize abortion. You know, it will be conducive to conduct which will uh, lead to uh, greater unhappiness on the part of those people who indulge in it, you know, et cetera, et cetera. The argument became secularized. The argument became one which can be um, um, taken part in by people whose orientation is that of manipulative rationality in secular humanistic terms we are less and less that traditional society that at one time we were. All right. Now, I said we would grow more affluent. We have grown more affluent. I don't have time to mention all these things, but notice the great paradox of affluence, which is that as we have become affluent, we have tend to value less and less the things that the economic system produces. One of the results of our growing affluence has been to produce a, seg a small but important segment of a generation of college students primarily and of college teachers uh, in an important degree who tend to come from upper middle class affluent backgrounds uh, and who view our economic system uh, with a rather elitist contempt. We have moved away from a reliance on traditional ways of doing things, uh, tradition, authority, um, God's will as interpreted by whomever, 
We have moved first in the 19th century to an orientation of conscience where we were concerned with um, organization, doing the right thing, uh, being a constructive citizen and so forth. We then moved to an orientation of reason uh, where all these things had to be balanced. Uh, at best, this orientation of reason was able to, to synthesize uh, what was good in these other orientations. At worst, it was a kind of rationalism and indecision and scientism. And now an important part of the country, a very small part, much smaller than the media would have us think, but nevertheless an important part, and important primarily because of the interest of the media and of the best educated segments of the society in them. This part now has gone from conscience to reason to the virtues of impulse. I'm referring here to, the, um, to Freud's distinction between conscience or among conscience, reason, and impulse as, as primary sources of energy uh, in the psyche. These virtues of impulse now, uh, having to do with joy, love, freedom, spontaneity, creativity, and so forth, these are the dominant virtues in the ideology of many young people uh, and of many intellectuals of any age and of many businessmen now increasingly. Uh, and beyond impulse, there is even a small group uh, which has found a new religious orientation, which is one of, of transcendence, certainly, but is also one which is opposed to all distinctions. Uh, it is one in which um, there is a mystic unity with the cosmos, in which there are no distinctions between parent and child or teacher and student, in which there is no legitimacy to authority, in which expanding the consciousness is assumed to be an unmixed good. You know, one might ask the question, why is the consciousness better expanded? You know, particularly expanded to the point where its boundaries are lost. Why is that good for it? Uh, but in the view of this ideology, uh, it is a positive benefit to break down all distinctions, particularly all structure and all authority. Well, this march, God's will to conscience, to reason, to impulse, to anti-structure makes a certain amount of sense if you see that economic necessity has a decreasing hold on people. As we solve our problems, we decrease the motivations people have had to deal with those problems. And as we decrease those incentives, people move on to a different set of more interior kinds of problems. Now, as we know, there are lots of problems outside the US and there are lots of problems in the less developed sectors of the US. Um, but it's easy to lose sight of these uh, in the upper middle class affluent ideology uh, in which one's inner consciousness is really the most important issue. In the 1930s, when someone dropped out of college, he did so to find a job, not to find himself. Uh, in some ways, it was easier to find a job than to find a self. It's an objective problem, and there are quite, you know when it has been solved. All right, I don't want to dwell on this. The point here is that solving one set of problems gives rise to a new set. Solving economic issues gives us the problems of affluence and a corresponding alienation that tends to go with it. In the areas of technology, there are so many technological prospects which will give us new social problems that it would be tedious to go through a list. But let me just mention a few. We know about the results of industrialization in creating pollution. We know the dangers of much current research in the biomedical sciences, which uh, has the prospect of giving us decisions to make which we don't know how to make. Uh, some of them are relatively trivial, like uh, who should get organ transplants, and when should the donor give them up? you know, which is a serious problem and uh, death has been redefined in certain jurisdictions in order to deal with this issue. Uh, and I could tell you anecdotes about cases which, borderline cases which have arisen under this. There are more serious um, consequences of this kind of, of research. Uh, obviously, it would be desirable to be able to alter some genetic information and to eliminate 
various kinds of hereditary defects to breed uh, better generations of human beings. But then we have to deal with a very difficult problem, and that is what kind of human being is, is really better beyond eliminating the defects, which there's consensus on eliminating. Should people be brave or good or, or kind or smart or handsome or, or what? Uh, people have never been able to uh, decide on what the proper mix of these characteristics is. Uh, suppose we had the capacity to influence these, a not impossible situation. In almost anything we look at, we see suddenly some major disadvantage, some major new problem, which will happen if we succeed in solving the very problem we've been trying to succeed in solving all along. Even weather control, we like to eliminate uh, the, the devastation that hurricanes cause, for example, on the uh, Gulf Coast and the East Coast. Um, but if we can divert the storms, where should we have them go? How do we solve that problem? Suppose you can have a storm go up the coast, and uh, you're the director of the, of the project. And your staff comes to you, and they say, there's a storm which has arisen in the Caribbean. And it looks as though, um, given the forces in the system, it can either go up the coast, uh, where it'll do so many billion dollars worth of damage, but will take very few lives because the people can be evacuated. Or, alternatively, we can divert it. It'll go out into the Caribbean, uh, and it'll do much less property damage because the people on those islands, for the most part, don't have much property. Uh, but it will kill a lot more people because they can't get away. Um, but on the other hand, many of those people are not Americans, and there are various other uh, characteristics of the situation that are described to you. Well, has anything that's been said so far helped you make this decision? You know, would you like to say what your trade-off ratio ought to be between lives and property? It's not an unprecedented decision. If you are deciding what a mine safety program, or what ought to be spent on safety in mines, what ought to be spent on safety precautions in building any skyscraper or bridge, how rough your training program ought to be in the Army, any number of decisions, there is an implicit trade-off ratio between lives and property. It's a very commonplace thing. We can make a list and tell you what the numbers are. Well, do you want to do it with weather too? People are working very hard to put themselves in a position to enjoy making that decision. You know, we are able to make more and more decisions and enjoying them less and less. Now, <clears throat> one could go on. Let me come back to the title I chose, Faust's Progress. I think I've said enough to, to indicate the general theme and to indicate the connection of this with methodology. How you look at the future, what you look for, what you try to expect, how you try to think through what you might do about what you can expect depends very much on the meaning it has for you. Now, the future has had different meanings, and this concept of progress has had different meanings at different times in our history. We have lots of poetic and mythic insights. Uh, for example, you remember it was the apple of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which resulted in the expulsion from the Garden of Eden. Prometheus brought the gift of fire and was punished for it. Icarus tried to precede, precede the Wright brothers, you know, and um, for this technological feat, um, he tried too hard, his wings melted, and he fell into the sea. Now, during the Middle Ages, the society was very clear. There was a legend then of Faust. Faust was a man who had extraordinary knowledge and power, and it was very clear to the medieval mind that extraordinary knowledge and power meant a bargain with the devil and that Faust would be condemned to eternal damnation. During the period of the Enlightenment, uh, the Industrial Revolution, Goethe rewrote the Faust legend, and he did it in a very characteristic way. This was the Romantic Faust, and Goethe's Faust made a different bargain with the devil than the medieval Faust had made. He asked, first of all, to be given powers he would never grow tired of. He didn't want to be sated, and his bargain was that when he was satisfied, at that point the devil could claim his soul, and he negotiated a long contract with the devil. Uh, I'll give you a typical clause in this contract so you get the flavor of it. He says to the devil, could you supply me with a sort of young lady who with her head on my shoulder will already be flirting with my neighbor? 
And the devil says, um, in effect, why the devil would you want that sort of girl? And um, he says, because I don't want to become complacent. I want to go on and on through a very long series. And the devil says, all right, if that's the kind of girl you want, I can supply that kind in large numbers. <laughs> so they agree on that and on a great many other things. And Faust becomes a great modern figure. That is a great modern figure up to about, say, 1965. Uh, he becomes a great entrepreneur, architect, manager of large projects. One of the things he does, for instance, is to clear an area, build dikes, settle people on it, but the dikes are not perfectly secure because that won't be good for the people. And this is, again, characteristic of him. Finally, toward the end of the play, he says to the moment before him, abide with me, thou art so fair. And at that point, the devil comes in to claim his soul, but then angels intervene. And what they say is, it's true that he made this contract, but he's really been so good at it. He's carried the whole thing off with such flair. He's been really a heroic figure, so we'll save him just the same, and, the, and they do. Now, here we are in the last third of the 20th century, and we no longer believe that if we get extraordinary knowledge and power, we are, for that reason, necessarily doomed. On the other hand, we no longer think that if we can only carry it off uh, in a very grand way, we'll almost certainly be saved. We've made a different bargain with the devil, and uh, this bargain has a hook in it which I'm afraid we may, may not have paid enough attention to. Our bargain, I think we all know what it is at this point, it go, runs like this. We want the knowledge, we want the power, but we will take responsibility for the consequences. So if we pollute the environment, we'll learn to clean it up. If we make weapons of mass destruction and pursue an arms race, we'll learn how to keep it under control. If we make large-scale data processing and there are possibilities of invasion of privacy, we'll work out safeguards. Uh, whatever it is, we know there's a problem. We'll work out the, the, the solution to that problem, too. That's our bargain. Now, in the first place, it's going to be very hard to keep that bargain. There are too many of these second-order consequences to the things that we're doing. And we not only have to solve most of them, we have to solve them all, or we're going to be in some serious kind of difficulty. But that's not the hook, because we sort of know that. The hook is this. As we solve these problems, and as we go on and on through this, through this acceleration of progress, we become more and more the kind of society which is committed to this manipulative rationality as a way of working out what kinds of people we are. And this change goes on and on. The fact that we have past points of no return, that we cannot go back, does not necessarily mean that there is any place further to go. So it goes on and on, and we become more and more in the situation of my systems analyst on his anniversary, trying to think things through, not being quite good enough at it, figuring out how to tie shoes, so forth, not doing it quite well enough. Now, this is not the kind of problem that leads to um, uh, racial extinction, um, necessarily, uh, the destruction of civilization, any of those things, although it can lead to those things, but it is the kind of problem that leads to a great deal of dissatisfaction with the kinds of progress that we do succeed in making. I think it may be an overriding philosophical issue of the next decade or two. This is one thing I anticipate about the future. I think we are going to be preoccupied currently and increasingly with questions of meaning, purpose, dilemmas, um, fundamental philosophical issues once again will seem important. The shallow utopianism, uh, particularly the shallow technocratic utopianism that held that there was a technical solution for every problem is going to be increasingly discredited, uh, but we may not have a satisfactory substitute for it. Now this sort of philosophical concern, which, which may overshadow a generation, is not normally solved in any way. What usually happens is that the problem is survived until some other issue comes along and looks more important. So this may be the best in some ways that we can hope for. It's also possible we may solve it. There may be some way of uh, reinstating the values of reason, uh, of finding a viable 
kind of rational, liberal, democratic solution to these problems. Perhaps there is. I don't know. But um, let me just close with this. Um, I once saw a cartoon that showed a dinosaur giving a talk to a group of dinosaurs. And what he was saying was, fellow dinosaurs, obviously we shall succeed in adapting to the, to the coming changes in climate. For if we do not succeed, we will not survive. Those were his last words. <laughs> We're, we have taken down, as you see, the, the podium in hopes to create a little closer rapport here between these gentlemen and yourselves, and I hope to be able to create some dialogue here for a few minutes at least before it becomes time to dismiss. Well, there are a great many um, different questions, uh, so, some of which, um, here's one that says, what are you? <laughs> I'm not sure how to answer that one. Um, some of these indicate some misunderstanding of what I was saying. I think maybe I, if I just take a minute, I have to clarify one thing. I wasn't advocating that we use more manipulative rationality as one questioner thought, or less, as another questioner thought. Um, I was trying to diagnose the current Malaz and to um, ask what, on what basis can we expect things to happen in the next couple of decades. And I was saying that some things we can expect, uh, and they have to do with uh, continued economic technological change, and then there are some very important um, cultural, psychological, social consequences of these continued changes, which I think we can also expect. And uh, that's simply what it was, a, a diagnosis. And I don't mean to be either optimistic or pessimistic about it. Uh, I would like to be realistic and uh, just assess it for whatever it is. Uh, and I think that's what it is. I think we're in for a, for a time of, of turmoil about meaning and purpose. I don't think that's necessarily catastrophic. Uh, there is one question, however, which, which has a, a rather specific answer that I, that I think I would like to address. And then um, I would like to, to get my colleagues in on this. And I know Dr. Sittler has a, a question. Um, this questioner says, you stated that we need a system for dealing with the unexpected. Do you believe that the federal government ought to establish a system for assessing new technologies to determine their effects on society and the environment, assuming that such a program is feasible, in order to regulate their use. Uh, I'm sure that, that John McHale would, would like to comment on that question, too. In fact, the federal government has established, um, as a result of the work of Congressman Daddario, a, a group which does what's called technology assessment in the legislative reference um, service attached to the Library of Congress. And um, technology assessment means the assessment not of the technology, but of the social consequences of the technology. Um, but it's very hard to find real examples of the success of technology assessment. It is very easy to find people who will make the case for doing technology assessment. And it's a very persuasive case. You know, we really ought to know uh, what the other consequences will be of the things we're doing. Uh, there are a couple of things they point to with hindsight. For example, if we could have foreseen the effects the automobile would have on the spread of our cities to suburb, the continued spread of our cities to suburbia, because it began before the automobile, and even the consequence for, for uh, courtship patterns and sexual behavior, because the automobile was portable, easily portable privacy. And here again, you know, the horse and buggy was too, but you couldn't get as far away as you can with the automobile, so that made a big difference. Uh, you know, you might have thought in 1900 that the automobile was just a better horse. 
and therefore wouldn't make any significant difference. In fact, it made some very big differences. Uh, and lots of things that look like simple quantitative changes really introduce big qualitative differences. And it would be very nice if we could perceive them. And now people are trying to do it, but mostly what they do is point out how nice it would be if we could do it. And that's because it's very hard to do. Uh, so I agree, yes, it would be good to do more of it, but uh, I don't expect many spectacular successes. Um, John, I don't know whether you wanted to, to get in on that. You could do more, though. And you think in yes. general, you're accustomed also to talking a lot to business. And you expect, you know, expect a large corporation to be thinking very much in terms of the market for the next 10, 20, 30 years. But in general, I found, in my experience, extraordinarily short-sighted in terms of their responsibility, as their actions affect directly millions of people, you know, millions of human lives, many sectors of society. Now, you're suggesting, well, the federal government takes over, they would have a certain measure of control over the actions, say, of large corporate industry. I wonder, is that the locus for it? Um, perhaps we should think of other sectors of society taking over this kind of responsibility outside of government, outside of corporate industry. We need much more, I think, uh, some kind of activated citizenry concerned about all these kinds of questions and problems. But you're still left with the issue, aren't you, of, of on what basis would the, would the decision be made? Now, for example, uh, I'd like to ask a question, if, if I might, of, of Dr. Borlaug. Um, because with respect to the Green Revolution, one hears many arguments uh, which are like those of the technology assessment movement and which argue that in spite of the near-term, an impressive near-term good that's done by the Green Revolution, it really ought to be stopped because in the long run it's going to make problems worse. And I think you alluded to, to two of these. One, one is the, the argument about the increased runoff from the more intensive fertilization. The other is the argument that um, this will only make it possible for the population to get larger and larger until once again it's as large as resources can support. And then we have the same problem, but now much more difficult. Now, the thing that worries me about what John McHale is saying is that I, I, I would be very much concerned, for example, in this particular case, if someone tried to stop the Green Revolution on the basis of these particular long-term concerns, because I think they're very tenuous compared with a very clear, immediate, short-term good that can be done. So you're going to have to weigh these short-term <coughs> versus the long-term considerations. Do you, do you have an answer, by the way, Dr. Borlaug, to, to people well, these Well, in the arguments? first place, everyone again wants to oversimplify all of these things. There's no good evidence that the Green Revolution contributes anything more to leaching of nitrates, let's say, into the water systems of the world. There's no good evidence of any kind to back this up, but very sharp penned writers spend endless hours of energy attacking things rather than helping in a constructive sort of way. And these people happen to be very often in very strategic situation and position. And I think, uh, again, all of these have to be weighed back against this whole element of common sense and fairness of judgment, of accomplishments and magnitudes of problems that remain to be overcome. I have little patience for this sort of thing. Not that I'm sensitive to criticism, but it's just a waste of energy. And if one uh, went back to wasting his time to counteract all of these things, you would never accomplish anything. Just pile up more paper, useless paper, and until we learn to digest this in the human stomach, well, I don't <laughs> think we're going to uh, make a whole lot of progress. And I think we maybe should go into some mutation genetics to make this come true. <laughs> Put cellulase in the gut of the human being so we could eat some of this paper that's being built up around us about it. And what you mentioned, uh, Dr. McHale, just a minute ago, I have grave fears of building up all of these responsibilities inside of government. I have tremendous fears of bureaucracies. This is one of the other things that will strangle us. That's right. And there are also, of course, serious arguments against uh, getting, uh, <coughs> let us say, uh, having corporations 
become uh, extremely sensitive to uh, what they conceive of as ecological considerations and exercising their corporate social responsibility, you get a kind of decentralized socialism which can be very inefficient, not at all in the public interest, which will lack accountability to the public through the political and electoral process which government has at least to some extent. Uh, and you'll get various kinds of corporations deciding with the best intentions in the world that because they read a well-known ecologist who told them that more fertilizer was going to kill off all the capacity of the oceans to produce oxygen, and there is a, at least one very well-known uh, biologist who is making that argument, um, you know, on, on that basis you'll get very responsible but um, um, misled people, perhaps misled, I don't know. Where are the measurements to back up many of these things? You see, we have no benchmarks. That's certainly there true. There are techniques for measuring all sorts of small quantities of, we call it pesticides or insecticides, whatnot. How far back do they go? Our, our techniques, methodology has improved so much that uh, what we measure very effectively today wouldn't have been even recognized 20 years ago by the former techniques. So. Uh, again, I say that uh, we've got a lot of research to do, and we just shoot off in every direction to correct all the ills of the world, and these have been accumulating a long period of time. And certainly, I want to see a better world, and I don't want to see it uh, ruined from here on in. I don't like Silent Springs either. But uh, just to start everywhere in making change without having some basis for making this, except complete theories, I'm against this. This is not the scientific method. This is emotionalism. Yes, one thing I think emer emerges fairly clearly, <coughs> and that is we know very little about what we are doing. I mean, we as a society, right. we know very little about, for example, when energy resources will really run out. We know very little about how to do things that we are, we know very little about what we are now doing. We know much less about things that are very different from what we are now doing. So elementary common sense would dictate that when we make changes, we stay reasonably close to something we have some familiarity with. So that very far reaching proposals like zero economic growth and so forth. Um, I think zero population growth is not such a far reaching proposal because we have seen lots of societies with zero population growth uh, or close to it, like Japan um, or Sweden, uh, where the population growth is also very low. And they work very well. Uh, so we know something about that situation. That's not bad. Zero economic growth, I think, in a society like ours is something we know practically nothing about. One ought to be suspicious of that kind of, of solution. Um, there's a, a, there's a well-known phrase by one of the academic experts in long-range planning, Charles Lindblom of, of, uh, of Yale, uh, and uh, he says that the decision makers act through what he calls disjointed incrementalism. Now that may seem like an insult, uh, but he didn't mean to insult them. Um, uh, he meant that uh, they move only a step at a time, and they're not interested in, in adopting policies that are very different. I think that's very sensible. Dr. Sittler, I know you, you said you uh, wanted to. Yeah. Uh, when you were speaking about various ways to confront the problematic of the future, you, you cited a, a girl who watched the television soap opera. and uh, It seemed to me you had a rather negative judgment and a poor opinion of the girl's response. What she said was, uh, the future will come to you. Uh, and I'm curious to know why you, why you had a negative evaluation of that response, because it seems to me, whereas it could be taken as a statement indicating a kind of collapsed lethargy before the problems of the future, it also could have been a statement of considerable wisdom, particularly when one reflects that in the biblical tradition, the verb to wait and to hope is the same root in Hebrew. That is, to wait was not the word which meant to collapse, to do nothing, to cease thinking, not to expect, nor not rationally to plan. 
But to wait in the Old Testament means to stand with a kind of confidence within the incalculable and the, and the obvious non-rational permutations and combinations which make up historical existence. And therefore, when the girl said, the future will come to you, she was not necessarily making a stupid crack. She, she might have been disclosing a very wise point of view in exactly the kind of a world that you spent an hour uh, describing. Yeah, so I, I think I've said enough about the, the dangers of, of uh, overestimating your ability to expect the future or to do something about it to make it clear that I also uh, expect to do a good deal of, of waiting for the future to come to me, and I think that's an appropriate attitude. But what this girl, and I didn't mean to be negative toward this girl, I, I used what she said as an illustration of the fact that some people now view the future with apprehension and dread rather than having any confidence in it. She didn't say, if you wait, the future will come to you. She said, it'll come and get you, which is a little different. And in fact, you know, the conversation was longer than that, and uh, she told me enough to make it clear uh, with how much dread uh, she looked forward to the future. And uh, about a, as a matter of fact, a couple of weeks after this conversation, she uh, underwent some sort of, of transformation and overcame her lethargy, organized a chapter of SDS uh, on what had been um, a very um, um, fashionable girls' college campus, uh, took over the administration building, um, and um, got herself suspended. Um, <laughs> So she didn't wait for the future. She went and met it more than halfway. It, I don't want to usurp your prerogatives, but I know we were told that we should break it at 5, and uh, we will. Well, I think that there will be plenty of opportunity this evening at 7 again, if you'll be reminded, to meet with these gentlemen individually and tomorrow. <laughs>